thanks to UP Travel for supporting this video. Hey there! This is the longest suspension bridge in the Western Hemisphere. Welcome to the Mackinac Bridge! It's story time! The Mackinac Bridge is a five mile long suspension bridge that connects Michigan's lower and upper peninsulas. In fact, it's the only way to drive directly from one peninsula to another. But that's not why it's interesting. Almost 70 years after it opened, this is still one of the longest suspension bridges in the world. And it's the longest between anchorages in the entire Western Hemisphere. It was also the first suspension bridge designed after this, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster, which meant that the pressure was on to get this thing right. I've been wanting to make this video for years, but I've been waiting until I built up enough street cred that the Mackinac Bridge Authority would actually let me onto the bridge, where pedestrians are almost never allowed. And y'all, that day has finally come! Now, I can't tell you about the bridge without also telling you about the Straits of Mackinac, because this place is cool in its own right. If you swam to the bottom of the Straits, you'd see that there's a huge canyon smack dab in the middle of it. It's called the Mackinac Channel. It forms the foundation for the modern day Straits, and it's actually an ancient river. Back when glaciers were slowly melting out of this area some 10,000 years ago, what's now Lake Michigan was at a slightly higher water level than what's now Lake Huron, and this river flowed east to connect them. The channel even had a 100-foot waterfall. It's now very underwater, but if it weren't, it would be one of the tallest drops in the state. Now, the sources that I read said that the Mackinac Channel was first described in 1938. Which is funny to me, because that date is definitely several thousand years off. The Straits have been an important travel and trading area for longer than anyone can really remember. Basically, as soon as the ice started moving out, people probably started moving in. Gotta get that fresh real estate. Today, most of the native folks in this region are part of the Anishinaabe people. In fact, many of the features in this area get their English names from the Anishinaabe word Mikinok, or turtle. And there's a larger story there that I'll talk about when I actually make it to Mackinac Island. For now though, pro tip. If you ever come through this area, you will notice that there are two distinct spellings of Mackinac, one with a C and one with a W. The difference has to do with whether the French or the British occupied that area. But they all come from the Anishinaabe language and they're all pronounced Mackinac, including the bridge. And here we'll pick up the story about a hundred years ago. At this point, Michigan was chugging along as a state, complete with two peninsulas. Ferries carried folks across the waves, the railroad companies had their own barges, and in deep winter, you could cross on the ice. But by the 1920s, people's desire to get to and from the Upper Peninsula was way higher than what those ferries could handle. During the summer, it wasn't rare to find a four-hour wait to cross. And during holidays and deer hunting season, some cars had to wait up to 17 hours. So within five years, the governor ordered a study to see if it'd be possible to build a bridge to cross this roughly four-mile gap. And so began a game of red light, green light that would last for about 30 years. Thanks to fundraising failures, the Great Depression, and multiple global conflicts, it took decades to get this thing going. And along the way, people suggested all kinds of ideas about what this bridge should look like, including underwater floating tunnels and a weird bridge system that hopped several islands before getting to the other side. But by 1954, they had locked in their design. They had funded the project using bonds bought by investors around the country. And finally, they were ready to go. With a budget of just under $100 million, it was time to build what was then the longest suspension bridge on Earth. And they were about to do it in the shadow of one of the most famous bridge disasters in U.S. history. In 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge had opened in Washington, and within a year, this happened. 
The failure of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was complex and had to do with something called flutter, which ultimately caused the bridge to rock out of control. Basically, the problem was aerodynamic instability. In other words, the wind interacted with the bridge in just the right way to get the whole thing galloping, giving it the nickname Galloping Gertie. And the next suspension bridge to be designed was the Mackinac. So the bridge designer, D.B. Steinman, got to work. And here, I'll pass over the story to Matthew, who today is the assistant bridge engineer for the Mackinac Bridge. The Mackinac Bridge was the first major suspension bridge designed in the United States after the Tacoma Narrows bridge disaster, uh, Galloping Gertie. In the wake of that, the designer of the Mackinac Bridge, uh, David Steinman, actually wrote a paper about winds and suspension bridges. And in that paper, he uh, put forth different uh, solutions to uh, the problem that was uh, experienced in Washington State. And that was uh, an open grading bridge design to allow the wind to flow through the deck and also a deep stiffening truss, which you can see on the outside here. And the deep stiffening truss dampens the uh, harmonic uh, movement of the bridge. And then the grading prevents that from starting in the first place. So with this uh, inside in the lane, the bridge is actually, with a factor of safety, designed to uh, handle 600 mile an hour winds <laughs> before even starting to have an issue. So David Steinman said that this was the most aerodynamically designed bridge ever. Steinman was actually very clear about this. In one of his papers, he repeats that at least aerodynamically, this bridge is 100% stable, something he said no one had ever done before, the true opposite of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And he and his team did it just with good science and design. Because there are basically two ways you can make a bridge stable. You can reinforce it to death, so it can handle any force the wind puts on it, or you could just be smart about how you design it, so that the wind never has a chance to apply those forces in the first place. You can work smarter, not harder. And that's what Steinman did. He took the research route, which allowed the Mackinac Bridge to be incredibly stable against the wind without costing millions of extra dollars in materials. Going back to those grates Matthew mentioned, though, they might be wonderful for aerodynamics, but if you've ever driven over the bridge, you might also know that they can be a little bit unsettling. Turns out, they also make a lot of work for the maintenance team. During my trip, I got to spend time not just with Matthew, but also with the maintenance supervisor and the safety boat captain. I learned not just how the bridge works, but also how they're keeping it alive almost 70 years later. And I got to ask how much more time this thing has left. I learned enough to turn those conversations into a separate video. And if you want to learn more about the present and the future of the bridge, you can watch it first when it goes live on Nebula and then here on YouTube. As part of that project, I also learned why the pitch of the bridge changes as you drive over it, which totally blew my mind when it finally clicked. But for now, I want to know how they built this thing. Groundbreaking for the bridge happened in May 1954, and the first thing they needed to do was set up the pillars. Now, building pillars in more than 350 feet of water is exactly as easy as it sounds, which is to say, not at all. In fact, they opted to dodge that canyon entirely and put the two main pillars right on either side of it. But that's still about 200 feet underwater. So to build the piers, they used steel caissons and coffer dams, two types of structures that were basically big steel cans. Caissons are built off-site and then sunk into the water, and coffer dams are built right at their final destination. To sink the caissons, the engineers even designed and built a special pile driver they called the gizmo that was strong enough to push them all the way down into the bedrock. Also, the gizmo, excellent wrestling name. What stood out to me, though, is that once you sink a big steel can, well, now you've just got a big steel can full of water. So how do they get that out? 
Turns out they often just used good old fashioned displacement. If you've got a bucket of water and you throw some rocks into it, those rocks will kick some water out and the bucket will overflow. Keep doing that and eventually your whole bucket will just be full of rocks. It was the same idea here. They used a fairly new concrete system called pre-packed, where you started by filling in the can with big crushed pieces of rock dumped in off a boat. Then a liquidy mixture of cement, sand, and fly ash was pumped in at high pressure to fill up all the gaps between the pieces of rock. Pre-packed worked underwater better than conventional concrete. And also, it meant that you didn't have to have huge mixers on site, which was a big deal considering they were using more than 900,000 tons of concrete for this project. With pre-packed, they turned those caissons and cofferdams into super heavy, sturdy piers. And to stop them from getting destroyed by ice, those piers are also protected by metal plates, and they're designed to handle 20 times more ice pressure than the maximum amount test engineers ever saw in the laboratory. So you've got the piers, next up were the main towers, and once the towers were in, it was time for the main cables. So the strands of wire inside the main cable are continuous across the top of the tower um, and the whole length. And this, that spinning operation when the bridge was constructed um, took the entire summer of 1956. 24 hours a day, the entire summer of these uh, dollies or contraptions that were laying cable along the catwalk and once they get to the anchorage they turn around and send them back the other way. So it's just one continuous strand of, uh, of cable inside the, main, of inside the main cable. So although they look like one thick piece, each main cable is actually made of many tiny cables tightly stuck together. So tightly in fact that the cables are still in excellent condition almost 70 years later. So I feel like I, I came across in my reading somewhere something about the the cables are so tightly packed together that there's not even any rust on the center cable. Is that true? Am I making that up? No, there, there are cables in comparison with a lot of suspension bridges in the world are in great condition. So when the cables were originally spun, they were coated in a red lead paste, which lead is a great substance for uh, preserving, uh, keeping water and preventing rust. It's not so great when it comes to health uh, and the health of our workers. So when we open up the main cables, there are a lot of uh, safety precautions that we take and we put a zinc paste back in to preserve them as much as possible. So all of our strands, which there are 12,580 individual strands in the main cable, and all of those are bound very tightly together um, and any little gap in between them would be taken up with that red lead paste. Now, when you look at the bridge, it's easy to think that the towers are the main pieces holding everything up, but they're not. So the suspender cables are what, is what transfers the load of the traffic and the dead weight of the bridge from the superstructure to the main cable. From there, it's not the tower what supports the bridge, but it's the two anchorages on either side. And those are just huge monolithic pieces of concrete that are probably still curing because they're so dense and heavy. And those two uh, anchorages on either side of the suspension span is what's holding up uh, the cables um, and taking the weight. Now, obviously a small amount is supported by the tower, but the prim primarily it's uh, the anchorages. The cables are pulling on the anchorages with about 30,000 tons of force. So to stay stable and secure, the concrete alone for each anchorage weighs about five and a half times that. But nonetheless, the anchorages are still mostly hollow. I actually got to go inside one of the anchorages with Matthew. And although I wasn't allowed to film down there for security reasons, I can tell you that the cables are entering what's basically a concrete cathedral with 150 stairs down to the bottom. It's a really cool space I had never thought about. 
In any case, the cables are the main thing holding up the road. That meant they needed to be in place before the bridge deck, because the bridge deck needed something to hang on. So catwalks were assembled, and the pictures are a little spooky. In fact, and unfortunately, two workers did fall and die during this phase of construction. To be clear, and because some people have asked, there are no bodies in the piers of the Mackinac Bridge. Five workers died during construction, and how each accident happened is fairly well documented. There are, there are no bodies entombed in the concrete. That said, finally, after the cables were in place, the rest of the pieces could be lifted up and secured together. And in November 1957, the Mighty Mac opened to traffic right on schedule. Building the Mackinac Bridge took 4,000 engineering drawings, 85,000 blueprints, millions of bolts and rivets, more than 42,000 miles of wire, and nearly a million tons of concrete. The project employed about 11,000 people, and last year there were more than four and a half million crossings. The bridge is beautiful, stable, efficient, and one of Michigan's icons. But working on the bridge also isn't a project that ended in 1957. Almost 70 years later, there's always some kind of maintenance and construction happening. Plus, planning for what comes next. But that is a story for the next video. Stay tuned. For now, Thanks to UP Travel for supporting this video. You can learn more about the Mackinac Bridge and the rest of the Upper Peninsula at uptravel.com and can follow them on social media for tips for planning a visit. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.